And we'll just roll right into the next talk, which next up we have Sean Main. Hey, Sean. Hello. All right. And you're here to say that you might already be a roguelike, following well in this discussion of what even is a roguelike or a road light, a forbidden topic. <laughs> yes, I am going to embrace that and also argue with it. So Excellent. That's the only way to do it. All right. Take the floor. Thank you. So... Um, my talk today, uh, you may already be a roguelike. Um, let me find, there we go. Um, or more accurately, it's about applying kind of a roguelike framework to add replayability in other game genres. I will say I created this talk uh, with kind of game devs as the primary audience, and specifically game devs kind of working outside of the roguelike space, uh, which I realized as I was putting this together probably this is exactly the wrong audience for, uh, since many of you are working explicitly in the space and therefore uh, are going to be less interested in, you know, what other uh, games and other genres and other devs might want to mine from the work we are doing um, or you all are doing. Um, but uh, so I will leave it as a little bit of an exercise to you if you want to kind of reverse engineer any of the elements here and look at kind of bringing in other external elements. But um, kind of here's my um, agenda. I'm going to talk a little bit about who I am and the roguelike game that I find myself working on, uh, give my definition here of kind of what a roguelike might be, uh, and then get into kind of uh, making meaningful player choices, challenges, and kind of a structure for runs. So um, I'm Sean Main. Uh, I've been a game designer for 10 years now. I, I worked for most of that time on Magic the Gathering. A lot of that was kind of working in a multiplayer space on um, projects like uh, Conspiracy, um, Battle Bond, um, and uh, for the last four years, I've been uh, working at Riot Games on uh, um, Legends of Runeterra, uh, a CCG as well. So I've been in this space for a very, very long time now. Um, and about a year ago, uh, we realized we had kind of a challenge on uh, Legends of Runeterra. That was a little bit unique, um, where players kind of weren't um, finding kind of like a meaningful power progression in exploring the game. Um, and kind of if you look, Card games are not always good at this with players across their careers, but if you look at kind of a traditional model for a CCG, you have a you know weak card that you put in your deck, you go, you acquire some more, you open some booster packs, you trade, you buy some cards, and now you've got better cards to replace them, and so you get this meaningful arc of power growth um, for your game, uh, for your career as a player. And we had a little bit of a unique problem because we were very generous with cards, and this was very much by design, um, that players would be have high access to different cards. We would give them out pretty readily. Players could meaningfully expect to collect all the cards in the game. Um, but as a result, you really didn't have that feeling that you were progressing because it was much more about, like, what do I want to play than about, you know, um, staircasing yourself up to that best deck. So I kind of was tasked with uh, looking at this problem, and I immediately suggested we kind of explore creating a roguelike mode within the game, uh, since roguelikes are really uniquely um, set up to kind of give a player a sense of power progression. Um, and I should say, um, before jumping right in, we kind of had this like experimental structure within the game that was labs where we could start kind of exploring the notion, um, like running experiments with our players. Um, and so kind of to, to briefly get into the element, the core elements that we needed to create kind of a roguelike game, we have these cards uh, and uh, we have now, we now added kind of items to them that made them stronger. So however strong as a card uh, Chempunk uh, Shredder is, um, we now have kind of this barrier ability that gets added to it. It is a little bit stronger. Throughout the course of your run, you will be presented with um, a series of choices uh, to upgrade your deck with these stronger and stronger cards. These are kind of the meaningful choices you make. 
you're also making meaningful choices about selecting powers that are kind of these um, things that are beyond the layer of individual cards and provide persistent bonuses across your runs or across your games. And of course, this was all kind of replacing the human opponents with AIs and um, within, and those were given kind of distinct personalities. So you kind of had expectations about what you were fighting, thematic decks that kind of uh, grew in power to challenge you uniquely um, across your run. And uh, our initial experiment was very, very heavily uh, roguelike um, in a very traditional uh, way. Uh, Saltwater Scourge replaced it, and that brought in a few more RPG elements, which I'll touch on briefly later. Um, but so now the question is kind of why? Why am I advocating um, people in other genres look kind of to the unique strengths that roguelikes can bring to them? So essentially, you have kind of these meaningful choices that the player is making that lead to kind of this sharp growth in power over the course of a short period of time. Um, and uh, the combinatorics of that lead to these very personal stories um, with Lab of Legends, that one of the early things that really clued us in that some things were working uh, were that people would come back with like, oh, I had this power in this card and, you know, let me tell you about this and oh my goodness. Um, and that was like great. You know, it's, it's, it's succeeding. It's succeeding at what we're trying to do. Um, the challenges um, provide kind of unique novelty and an opportunity for kind of high skill mastery um, through kind of the parallel learning in the inconsistent way you apply the lessons that you've learned within the games. And then that run structure uh, just leads to a high replayability where you um, are expecting to be tested often fail and jump right in um, again. So let me give my, my definition here. I'm gonna talk about roguelike as a framework rather than a genre. Um, so uh, a game whose core loop embraces procedurality to increasingly challenge the player as they grow in power across their run. Now I am quite confident that smart people can uh, disagree reasonably with every word in this definition uh, and that you know there's parts of it that I myself am a little uncertain of but I want to use this uh, moving forward so that's uh, it at an abstract level if I was talking to someone working on a game though I would break this down into kind of three core components give the player inconsistent meaningful choices that allow them to grow in power uh, this is to say the player um, should not have access to everything. They should have mutually exclusive um, uh, decisions that they are making, decision points within the game where they are choosing, do I want the sword? Do I want the shield? Do I want to be um, move left or move right? Um, and then give the player inconsistent escalating challenges that test those choices. Uh, the key word between these two is uh, inconsistent, obviously, which is where kind of the procedurality that uh, I think of as very core uh, comes from. And um, I have a cat that is distracting me right here. Excuse me, as I'm looking down. He's very oh, sure. That's the cat. Here. Bring up the cat. <laughs> no, it's up to you. <gasps> yes. <That's not> <laughs> Oh my god, you mentioned your cat in your bio. Okay, anyway, I'm sorry to distract, but I'm sure everyone appreciates it. Oh, no worries. Cat. Thank you. Um, so, um, and then all of this is within kind of a finite run structure um, so that the players, um, whether they succeed or fail, uh, they have made a series of choices and uh, can start a new run and make a new series of choices and be challenged anew. Uh, if you look at, you know, the very classic roguelikes, you can see exactly how they are doing this, how they are, um, uh, you are choosing between different weapons you want to wield, wield um, 
you are choosing what you want to buy in shops? Do you drink that weird potion? Do you need to? And, um, you know, you can look at very clearly the inconsistent choices and the inconsistent challenges that players are faced with. Um, to make sure, though, this definition isn't too all encompassing, let's look at some examples of things that don't fit and how they have been adapted um, to, to the, the genre um, or the framework. Um, so um, take a classic game with Super Mario Brothers. Um, the, can, the runs for the player are consistent. Uh, every time you go in, the same uh, pipe is going to lead to the same secret area. The same jump is going to be there uh, to challenge you anew. And that's fine. You know, there's nothing against the, that game. Usually, this means that they're kind of built on exhaustible content that the player eventually is able to make their way through. Uh, the classic one to point to here is Spelunky that takes kind of that pl uh, platformer um, structure and now um, applies it more inconsistently so that um, one run to the next, the player can't anticipate where those secrets are. They can't anticipate um, uh, exactly what jump they're going to need to make. And they are taking on kind of novel um, uh, power-ups. One run, you might have a lot of bombs and be able to move through um, the area uh, skipping past large sections, where the next you have a shotgun and you are able to uh, take on uh, enemies a little bit more aggressively than you might in another game. Uh, again, going back to um, uh, collectible card games, um, they actually provide a lot of the inconsistent challenges because you never quite know what your opponent is going to be bringing to the table. Um, but you have access to the cards that you have access to and can adapt you know, pretty readily um, in whatever fashion you want. So it doesn't really have the core um, meaningful, mutually exclusive choices uh, that define more roguelikes. Now, the first that I know that really kind of brought this uh, roguelike deck builder genre is uh, Dream Quest, um, which uh, uses a very classic uh, dungeon structure um, to provide the player with these meaningful choices. Um, and then Slay the Spire is obviously like the probably the big biggest one in the genre, and then Lab of Legends, um, our own. Uh, it's kind of building on some of the lessons from those other games. Um, but breaking down kind of these individual components, uh, what would make a good player choice? Uh, the top thing I would talk about is modularity. Uh, so Dicey Dungeons uh, is this kind of core um, brings like a Yahtzee core mechanic into a, a roguelike space. Um, and uh, dice are great because you can manipulate them in finite ways. You might have an item that translates um, a roll into damage, another that translates into um, defense. And then you have kind of, um, you can imagine where different items can kind of um, manipulate those dice in very finite, uh, discrete ways. Um, the choices should be very impactful. Uh, so Hades is probably a great example of this, where um, this Daedalus hammer is going to change the style of your run, and based on whether or not you get certain combinations, you're going to have like a meaningfully different experience. Uh, good choices are going to recontextualize other choices. So coming back to Lab of Legends, um, Here's this choice of three powers. Um, one helps your units if they survive damage. One, another one helps them, you know, if they're big, they deal damage. Which one is better? I couldn't really tell you definitively. It depends on the deck that you have been building up to this point. And depending on which one you choose, you might now, um, your later choices are going to be affected by it. And then, uh, Ideally, if you are a game looking in this space, I would ask how many unique combinations can you provide the player? Going back to this example, I don't know that I'd ever seen this example before I um, you know, screenshotted this as part of the talk, but um, the 50 to 60 different items combining with the 
500, 600 cards in the game, um, provide you know a lot of opportunity to have something truly novel come up that can surprise, delight the player. Um, good challenges. Uh, so I would say one of the keys is testing the player along multiple axes. Uh, if you know you can get faster or stronger, but faster is always better um, in every scenario, it's not going to be a meaningful um, challenge, and the player is going to learn to make certain choices. Um, Driftlands is a great example of this, where you literally have two decks of cards that you are managing, uh, one for talking, one for fighting, and throughout the game, you need to make choices of which one do I want to make better, how do I want to engage with this particular opponent to either fight or talk them out of things, and there will be different rewards and things uh, and different paths depending on which. Um, I jump over something? OK. Uh, allow the player to demonstrate skill. Um, so this is mostly about like um, make sure that even smaller challenges that the player can readily overcome are going to be meaningful and interesting to the player. A lot of games use kind of persistent help um, to do this to make sure you, know, you are fighting the easy enemy, but did it deal some damage to you? You will care about that later, and therefore, um, you know, how many of these five damages can you take? Um, Dungeon Beneath is a really interesting game that's kind of in a roguelike um, auto battler space. Uh, I don't know if the creators would describe it that way, but um, one of the things that it uniquely does is provides kind of these um, distinct bonuses. Here, killing the Golden Wisp gets you some extra gold, so a novice player um, could come to this and be happy that they won the battle. A medium skilled player could be happy that they didn't take any damage. And a very skilled player has something that they are also able to engage with here by did they get the additional objective. Um, and then kind of looking at this um, structure for a run, um, there's a few things that uh, I would argue for. Uh, and one is uh, enforced kind of distinct uh, novel starting positions. So um, NetHack is probably a good example here, or any of the classic ones where you're able to choose a class. Um, and uh, especially because they not only have you make kind of this meaningful choice um, that will contextualize your run, um, but also those in turn have randomized um, stats and things associated with them so that uh, one route to the next, you have a little bit of difference. Um, in Lab of Legends, we achieve this through having a number of different champions that you can start with with very distinct decks, even if the core um, after that is going to um, be similar. Um, the fact that you are playing Misfortune versus Talia versus Braum is going to change them. Uh, Hades is a good example where you know you have the weapon, but you also have kind of this boon in the first run that is going to uh, immediately set you off with some choices that are impactful. Um, discourage boring behavior. Basically, if the players can do something that is going to be against their fun, um, but is useful, they will probably engage in that. Um, NetHack is a great example where all the classic ones with their hunger system to kind of press you forward and ensure that um, you don't, you know, dig through every nook and cranny of a level um, before moving on. Um, you have to kind of press on. I, I particularly bring this one up because a lot of games naturally uh, will encourage some conservatism on the part of the player where they learn to be more and more careful about things. And that can easily lead to you know, optimizing themselves out of fun and um, whatever you can do to kind of discourage that and ensure they are pressing forward and doing the things that are the satisfying things um, is going to be um, powerful. Um, permadeath, mostly, mostly here I'm kind of um, citing uh, or permadeath, permanence of consequence. There, there's a lot of ways to frame this. Um, I'm mostly kind of citing 
positive examples. I'm going to um, touch on one that I think uh, was a misstep that we made um, in Lab of Legends. So we were, uh, the, the original Lab of Legends was very roguelike, it does kind of the, the classic permadeath thing, you know, um, and you unlock higher and higher difficulty tiers as you win runs. Um, but we were bringing in these additional roguelike elements, map exploration, XP system to um, uh, like gate some of the kind of rewards you were getting. And we were kind of nervous that uh, permadeath, we think, is one of the things that is a turn off to a wider appeal uh, of roguelikes. Um, the notion that you are kind of expected to fail repeatedly. Um, and so we tried kind of uh, embracing, we, we talked about it a lot as like more of an RPG aesthetic of like, you have died, um, but keep going, that's okay. You know, you have more to do, that's not the end. Um, the problem was we kind of had this roguelike core otherwise, where uh, you would have those choices that you made, tested meaningfully, but the um, if you failed those tests and died, there was not a consequence to that. And so you could easily end up in a position where you'd made a series of choices that were going to continue to cause you to fail and you'd be banging your head against a wall. Now, in a full RPG structure, um, there is always the ability to kind of grind up and keep going. Um, but here, uh, when we didn't provide that to the player, uh, there was a little bit of difficulty because uh, and players needed to be wise enough to enforce it themselves and retire a run or something if they felt like they had made bad choices and weren't going to succeed. Uh, and the last one I'm going to say here is probably the, the most controversial talking to a roguelike audience. Um, I would argue that meta progression uh, is a real natural pairing with a roguelike core. If the players, the players want to be rewarded for their time, their investment, um, and if you look at a very traditional roguelike, uh, the only way that a player is able to improve and get better and get a little bit further into the next dungeon that they run is their own skill. And that's very rewarding in a hardcore kind of way, but uh, the extent to which you can kind of use meta progression to um, assist players, and it is not purely a matter of like, did I as a human player on my 10th run, my 20th run, my 50th run, um, get a little better? The game is there to help you out and provide a little bit of a, of a boost along the way. And uh, Rogue Legacy is probably the classic example that comes to mind because so much of the game is about this meta progression. But obviously, um, Hades is the one that is probably top of mind for everyone um, because it truly makes an art out of this element of the game. And uh, a huge portion of the experience is enjoying kind of the narrative elements that exist within the meta progression, engaging with that, the, the loop of the meta progression as a reward for doing well within runs. Um, and that is it. Uh, any questions? Okay. Looks like I have about six minutes. Nice, we actually have some time for questions. Excellent. Uh... Awesome. Well, thank you. It's awesome to have the time. Uh, the first question is the most important one, I'm afraid. What is your cat's name? Ah, yes. My cat is Max. Max. Um, he is, he's now not at a greeting. Oh, there you go. Oh. He is a very sweet cat. He is a bit of a goof. He is very large. Um, and yeah, sometimes gives me a look like he's... Um, like, can you believe that? What what just happened? Um, well, we all love Max. Thank you. <laughs> um, and then, you know, a serious question. Uh, Hypergarden asks, could you briefly explain modularity again in terms of good player choices? Yeah. Um, great question. This was one. Okay, I'm not going to try to 
find it exactly. But um, so uh, modularity is the concept um, that you're using essentially the same building blocks for all of the um, player experience. So things, systems readily are interacting with each other. And um, the, like I'm trying to think, like the negative example would be something like um, you're presented with a choice and you can pick a long sword that will do more damage or ballroom dancing um, that you can use to um, uh, go on dates. And now like those are gonna be like systems that are not like um, interacting with each other most likely at all. I'm very intrigued if you are, are going to uh, create the game that, that combines those. It's called Black um, Red Dungeon, but yes. That's, yeah, yeah, you know, no, that's, that's a fair example that I wanted to work into this, and there were better examples for most things I didn't didn't get to, but sure. Yeah, boy, Boyfriend Dungeon, exactly. Um, but like, um, yeah, like it, the, the extent to which like the choices can have like threads that are going to connect to each other and be like interacting with those same core systems um, is going to be kind of uh, advantageous. Um, and yeah, Boyfriend Dungeon is actually a great example because like, yes, meaningfully the the sword or the ballroom dancing are going to be a meaningful choice because um, they both affect, yeah, your ability to go on dates and explore the dungeon further. Right. Versus generally where something like a cosmetic choice and a gameplay choice are completely parallel. And so, you know, you don't get the opportunity for interaction. Precisely. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Um, another <laughs> fun question from Hamlet, which I also just like, uh, has Max inspired any content from any of your games? We all love <laughs> Max. <laughs> I am sad to say he has not. Oh, he needs um, to get on that. <laughs> I've had him for about two and a half years now. I mean, um, he hasn't I am, the game yet. <laughs> I am inspired by him. You know, he likes to hang out with me here a lot during the day. Um, but uh, no, I don't believe there's any. Yeah, I, I am. I am sorry he is not. Uh, well, 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 we'll expect an update on that in the future. You gotta, gotta bring it in. I will, I will admit my boss's cats make an appearance in the game, um, but... <laughs> but not your own cat. Not my cat. For Max. I think Max yeah. is the best cat. Um, yeah. We do have one other um, non-Max related question, also from Hypergardens. Thank you, Hypergardens. Uh, what would you suggest for that stage in design where you have a strong core mechanic, but a million possibilities for secondary loops? Oh wow, that's that's a big question for two minutes. Yeah, <laughs> um, I mean, I I have a big philosophy in terms of game design, which is um, uh, play test early um, and play test in the roughest shape you can. You are going to learn things consistently um, by uh, getting some very rough appro approximation and kind of squinting imagining like what are the consequences of this um looking at like what people uh, what your playtesters are finding fun um and i think you're going to learn a ton from that and that's also going to start teaching you like how do you layer systems together um yes that's probably the best you know one minute version i can give. yeah yeah i think that's a, a solid answer to a very big question for for one minute so 